Let me start by saying uh, again that I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, I think the uh, title that uh, Wolfgang, uh, I mean, with my work in German, uh, this is what he said I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, cosmic rays and uh, its implications to the understanding of uh, climate change. Uh, given that uh, uh, Professor Svenfak is uh, here going to talk about uh, cosmic rays, I'm uh, going to concentrate on the uh, solar climate uh, link. Um, so I'm going to show you the evidence that the, the sun has a large effect on climate and uh, how uh, this affects our understanding of uh, climate change uh, over the 20th century, over the 21st century, and so on. Okay, so uh, if you fall asleep uh, after lunch, uh, I mean, I'm lucky I'm giving you this uh, presentation so I cannot fall asleep. But uh, if you fall asleep, just remember this point so that uh, if you ask later, uh, if you're asked what am I going to talk about, these are the points to take uh, home. Uh, first, uh, the sun has a very large effect on climate. Uh, the effect is much larger than what you would expect from just changes in the solar irradiance, uh, which means that there must be an amplification mechanism. Uh, the IPCC, or say the mainstream uh, climatology, ignores this, uh, ev the evidence for this. Uh, they ignore the fact that the sun has a large effect on climate. Now, by doing it, they uh, think that uh, Climate sensitivity has to be on the large side, and uh, as a consequence, they also predict that the 21st century temperature warming is going to be much larger than what it is going to be uh, for, say, a business as usual uh, um, scenario. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering, just a second, uh, I'm coming here and giving a different uh, story than what the standard uh, paradigm is. How? how is it, how does it stand in comparison with the standard uh, picture, or say what's wrong with the standard picture, um, so that uh, you'll realize that uh, there's nothing inconsistent with what I say and the data. So I'll show you that the uh, IPCC does not support the uh, standard picture, and that uh, more importantly, it actually ignores data which uh, would have otherwise forced them to change the standard law. Okay, so um, the first point, the sun has a large effect on climate. So to begin with, uh, there are many correlations showing you that the uh, sun affects the, the climate. And what do I mean by uh, solar uh, variability? Uh, the sun is not uh, a constant uh, star. It doesn't emit constant amount of radiation. And more importantly, the uh, non-thermal component uh, of the sun, uh, whether it be um, a changes in the uh, solar uh, magnetic field, the number of sunspots, the solar wind, which is actually important because it affects the climate, uh, the amount of UV and things like that, they change with the solar cycle. Uh, every 11 years or so, the north and southern uh, uh, poles of the, uh, of the sun uh, switch, so we have a quasi-periodic 11-year solar cycle, but on longer timescales, we have uh, secular variations in the uh, solar activity, which also translates, uh, as we'll see, to changes in, uh, in climate. Okay, so the sun is not a constant star, and uh, as we shall see, it affects the climate. Uh, I think this is one of the nicest correlations that you can see between uh, solar activity and climate on Earth. Uh, we see here, uh, oh, this is by the way work by the uh, Augusto Mangini group uh, up the Neckar River in Heidelberg. So it's uh, really local, uh, but it's not that local because the data that you see here is a solar pro proxy at the top and a climate proxy at the bottom. At the top, we see carbon-14 to carbon, uh, say, 12 uh, isotope ratios as uh, derived by tree rings all across the world. Um, carbon-14 is a cosmogenic uh, isotope. It's formed in the top of the atmosphere by high energy particles coming from outside the solar system called cosmic rays, but these High energy particles are modulated by solar activity such that uh, when the sun is more active and the solar wind is stronger, we get less cosmic rays reaching the Earth and less formation of carbon-14. So this basically is a proxy of solar activity. On the bottom, we have a, another isotope ratio. Here we see the ratio between oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 in stalagmites in a cave in uh, Oman, in this case, which is a proxy of the temperature of the water in the Indian Ocean, which is where the water coming uh, to the, uh, falling as monsoon water in Oman, and uh, later uh, seeping through the ground and forming those uh, nice uh, stalagmites, or stalactites. Um, as you can see, there is a very nice correlation. Can you see the correlation? Oh, you don't need glasses, that's good. Another example, uh, here we have 
Again, a carbon-14 is derived from a tree rings in blue, and in black we have a, a measurement or some proxy of the climate in the northern Atlantic, showing you whether it was cold or warm. We see here the, um, the uh, marine proxy is basically looking at annual layers in the cores drilled out of the uh, seafloor. Uh, when it's colder, ice can, uh, can drift on the sea and reach uh, uh, further south before it melts and leaves the uh, ice rafted debris on the ocean floor. Colder weather would allow glaciers to drift further south and you will uh, see it as uh, dark layers of ice rafted uh, debris. So this is basically a proxy of the climate in the northern Atlantic. And again you see a very nice correlation which demonstrates that the sun, as proxied by the carbon-14, affects the climate, in this case, northern Atlantic. Now, there are, very, there are a lot of examples like that showing you that climate all over the Earth is affected by the sun. On the 11-year solar cycle, uh, you see variations. Uh, in red, you see variations in the cosmic ray flux, which again are modulated by uh, the solar activity. And in blue, you see variations in the low altitude uh, cloud cover on Earth, I show this, um, this uh, uh, correlation because it's going to be the link to the next talk that you're going to hear because this not only shows that the sun has an effect on the climate, it actually pinpoints or uh, indicates what is the actual mechanism that does so. Okay, so we've seen that the sun has a loud effect on climate, but the question is, can we quantify this effect? Maybe it's small and uh, you don't have to take it into account. Maybe it's large and you have to take it into account. So can we quantify the, uh, the solar uh, climate effect? And the answer is yes. Uh, here we see two graphs uh, together. In red, you see the uh, solar cycle. Um, it's the solar constant reconstructed from various proxies. So you can see the 11 year solar cycle uh, every 11 years or so, uh, so, the sun is more active and it uh, uh, translates, for example, to a slightly brighter sun. But uh, in addition to that, in black, you see the rate of change of the sea level. When the sun is more active, you see that the oceans are expanding, the sea level is rising. Now, on short timescales, most of the sea level change is because of absorption of heat. Okay, so what you're doing here, you're measuring the flux or the incoming flux associated with the solar cycle. So you, you're using the oceans as a huge calorimeter to quantify the effect of the sun. Why is it important? It's important because uh, it tells us that the sun has a large effect on the climate and it tells us exactly how large it is. Okay, you can quantify, you can play this game of quantifying the uh, solar forcing uh, with different data sets. Uh, I've shown you the uh, sea level change with tide gauges and with uh, satellite altimetry. You can look at the amount of cloud cover which changes over the solar cycle, the previous graph I've showed you, and you can, uh, using the satellite data, you can translate this change in cloud cover to a change in the radiative forcing, and you find this uh, number. Uh, you can also look at the uh, change of the uh, sea surface temperature of the oceans or the uh, uh, ocean heat content from uh, buoy data over the past, say, uh, 50 or 60 years. In all cases, you see that the radiative forcing associated with the solar cycle over uh, the 11 year solar cycle is about one to one and a half watts per square meter. Now, for comparison, if you just look at what is the change in the solar irradiance over this time scale, uh, you f and you divide it uh, over the surface of the Earth, you find that the solar forcing, just because of the change in the irradiance, the luminosity of the sun, is about 0.2 watts per square meter. Now, if you open the, uh, I know, the IPCC, uh, the scientific report, they'll tell you, yeah, of course, we take the sun into account. <coughs> but what, they'll what they are actually doing, they are taking this effect into account. They are not taking the whole effect that the sun has on climate. Uh, we have seen that the, uh, the sun has a large effect on climate, you can quantify it. And the big question is, why doesn't the IPCC scientific report take that into account? This thing was published in a peer-reviewed journal in 2008, so it satisfies all the criteria of what the IPCC should be uh, looking at, but it's not there. I think that uh, if they do take it into account, it will have to change their um, conclusions about what drives climate, or, or in particular, uh, how 
large is climate uh, sensitivity. Okay, so one of the reasons why they ignore it is because uh, of the implications that the solar climate link has on the climate. So what are the implications? Now, a very crude way of looking at uh, the climate, uh, the climate response would be um, in this way. Uh, if we were trying to explain a 20th century uh, temperature change with uh, just as a response of uh, climate drivers, then uh, you have the mainly anthropogenic forcings to play with. Uh, and in order to explain the uh, somewhat smaller than one degree temperature increase over the 20th century, you will need a high climate sensitivity. Okay? But this high climate sensitivity will necessarily translate into a high temperature increase over the 21st century for a given emission scenario. Now, if you have another positive forcing, in this case the sun, because the sun's activity increased over the 20th century, the combined forcing is going to be larger. So in order to explain the temperature uh, increase that you have seen over the 20th century, you will now need a lower climate sensitivity. And with a lower climate sensitivity, you will get that the predictions for the 21st century temperature increase are going to be smaller as well. Okay, again, this is a very crude uh, picture, but it uh, underlines what is the uh, main reason why, uh, say, ma mainstream climatology is trying uh, its best to ignore the solar climate uh, effect. I'm also saying that it's very crude because there are other things uh, which affect the temperature change. For example, uh, natural variability, which I guess we're going to hear from uh, Professor Linton's uh, talk. Okay. Um, can you explain a 20th century when the sun has a, an effect on climate? Uh, the answer is that you can explain the, te the 20th century temperature change even better than when you exclude the effects of the sun. Here you have the results of a climate uh, model which uh, allows for the sun to have a large effect of, on, the, uh, on the climate. In fact, it allows it to have an effect with a free parameter and the fit allow, uh, finds also what this uh, parameter is, and lo and behold, the best estimate for what the uh, sun has been doing over the 20th century uh, agrees with what, you, what we measure with the oceans uh, that it does. Now this fit, when you do this uh, fit, you find a residual between uh, observations and, um, and model, uh, which is twice smaller than what you would expect or what you get from uh, global circulation models, which ex excludes the real effect that the sun has. Okay, uh, you can use uh, this model. Um, this model uh, uh, assumes uh, relative forcings uh, or standard relative forcings that uh, we have imposed on the uh, climate. And then you can integrate it forward in time uh, for the parameters that uh, fit the 20th century. And when you do that many times, you can get a prediction for what the temperature increase over the 21st century is going to be under a business as usual scenario. Uh, for comparison, these are the scenarios of the uh, IPCC. We have seen that uh, if you take into, account, uh, take into account the sun, then you have to change uh, your uh, perception of what the climate has been doing or uh, various uh, things about the climate. Um, but then you can ask the question, just a second, uh, you know, every day I hear the IPCC coming out with the story. What's wrong with this story? I mean, how can I compare this story to what uh, I'm uh, telling you? There's no empirical evidence uh, showing you that CO2 must have a large effect uh, on the climate. And the other thing is that there's no empirical evidence that the climate sensitivity has to be large, which is what uh, they assume when fitting the 20th century and predicting uh, 21st century climate uh, change. And uh, a, an example for the fact that there's no evidence for uh, CO2 affecting the climate is uh, this graph that uh, we have seen uh, uh, featuring in, featured in uh, Al Gore's uh, um, science fiction movie. You see here a reconstruction of the CO2 from uh, ice cores, uh, in this case in uh, Antarctica, in this case in Antarctica. And uh, on the top, in the red line, you see a reconstruction of the temperature on Earth. Now, you see that there's a very nice correlation, right? Okay? You don't need glasses. It's okay. You see, you, you see it. Uh, but, okay, so Al Gore, in, in the movie, he says uh, there's a very complicated uh, relations, but you see that when there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, the temperature is higher because he wants to make us think that this is evidence demonstrating that a large uh, amount of CO2 in the atmosphere necessarily causes an increase in the temperature. 
What he didn't tell us is that uh, CO2 generally lags variations in the temperature. So although CO2 should have some effect on the climate, this graph that uh, Algo has shown us doesn't indicate anything uh, in that direction. It just tells us uh, that uh, there's a very nice uh, a equilibrium between CO2, which is in the atmosphere, and CO2, which is uh, dissolved uh, in the oceans or undergoing some chemical uh, equilibrium in the oceans. Um, and this equilibrium between CO2 in the oceans and CO2 in the atmosphere depends on the temperature, such that when you hit the oceans, you release more CO2, which is why the CO2 generally lags behind the temperature. Okay, so this is a, a very interesting graph, but it tells you nothing about the effects of CO2 on the climate. Um, there's also no a, evidence that the uh, climate sensitivity has to be large. The it claims that the uh, climate sensitivity has to be somewhere between one and a half to four and a half degree increase for doubling the amount of CO2 all originate from climate models. Uh, people uh, run global circulation models and uh, they get uh, responses, uh, say, in this range, and then they say, okay, so we think that the climate sensitivity is in this range. What they don't tell you is that um, the climate models uh, are actually very bad in predicting the climate sensitivity. And the reason they are very bad in predicting the climate sensitivity is because, because of, in particular, one uh, feedback. Um, if we increase the, um, the uh, radiative forcing, uh, so suppose we put some uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, we will block uh, some of the infrared uh, going uh, out into space. And in order to, um, in order to uh, balance the uh, radiation going back into space with the radiation that we get from the sun, the temperature at the surface has to increase. But uh, in addition to this direct effect, if we increase the surface of the temperature, we'll, we are going to evaporate more water. So the atmosphere is going to be more opaque because of the water. So that's a positive uh, feedback. But in addition to the water vapor in the atmosphere, we're also going to have more clouds. And the clouds can do a lot of things. They can cool, they can warm. And in, in fact, nobody knows by how much the clouds are going to change. And all the global circulation models essentially treat clouds with recipes. Okay, they tell us, uh, or you put into the global circulation model, uh, by how much the clouds are going to change if you change the water vapor by a given amount, or the temperature by a given amount. And this graph here, oh, sorry, this graph here uh, demonstrates that the cloud cover is the dominant uh, uncertainty. Uh, this graph Incidentally, it's from 1989. Um, quite uh, bizarrely, things didn't change that much since then. Uh, you see here a bunch of uh, climate models, and uh, this here is the sensitivity or equilibrium sensitivity of the climate model by how much the temperature is going to change if you double the amount of CO2 as a function of the uh, uh, feedback that the model has through cloud cover. This basically depends on the recipe that you put in order to describe the clouds. And you see that all the climate models resides uh, close to uh, a line, which tells us that this is the dominant parameter affecting the climate sensitivity. Since we don't know this, we don't know this. Okay, so basically, global circulation models are bad in predicting uh, climate change. Okay, uh, then uh, there's a problem with the IPCC uh, evidence. Uh, we are told that uh, uh, we have evidence proving that humans are the cause of uh, global warming over the 20th century. What is this evidence? In quotation marks, because it's not real evidence. There are two main arguments. The, main, uh, the first argument is that you cannot explain the 20th century without anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gases. The other argument is that the 20th century warming is unique. And if it's unique, then it's probably human. But both arguments uh, have loopholes. Well, first, uh, this is uh, from the fourth assessment report. We see here a fit between the temperature increase, uh, observed the temperature increase in black, and the uh, model fits to it. And these are models which include the uh, anthropogenic forcings, and this is the result of climate models which exclude the anthropogenic forcings. And you see that you cannot explain the 20th century warming if you exclude the anthropogenic forcing. Right? Wrong. Why is it wrong? It's wrong because we have seen that there is another a climate driver, and that's the effect that the sun has on climate. Okay? They don't take it into account. 
Okay, the other thing is uh, the temperature increase over the 20th century is not unique, and uh, the thing that you need to do in order to uh, see why is to just uh, Google uh, climate gate and realize that the, the graph that was used in order to demonstrate that it's, un that it's unique is, um, a, I don't know how to describe it uh, better. <coughs> what? Um, <clears throat> religious uh, Jews are not supposed to uh, uh, mix things which are not of the same kind, like uh, wool and, um, and, uh, and cotton, because one comes from animals and one comes from, uh, from uh, plants. It's called uh, Shartnez, and this is exactly that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we've seen that the evidence doesn't support the IPCC picture, but it's more than that. The evidence contradicts the IPCC uh, picture. Uh, there's evidence that the effect of CO2 on the climate is small, and there's empirical evidence that shows us that the climate is not sensitive. And I'll show you a few examples. Here you see a reconstruction of the global temperature over the past half billion years. Okay? It's from oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 uh, isotope ratios, and it was uh, carried out by uh, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Jan Weiser. At the top, you see a reconstruction of the CO2 levels in the atmosphere uh, at the same period, over the same period. For example, uh, 450 million years ago, we see that the CO2 levels in the atmosphere were about 10 times larger, this is a logarithmic scale, 10 times larger than what they are today. On the other hand, the amount of glaciations that we had during that period was more extensive than what we have today. Okay, so you can use this lack of correlation between the CO2 and the temperature to place an upper limit on the effects of CO2 uh, on the atmosphere. And lo and behold, the upper limit that you get from it is that if you double the amount of CO2, the temperature shouldn't increase by more than one and a half degrees, which is exactly the lower range of the IPCC. Another example for a discrepancy is uh, since the first IPCC report, actually since the Charney report from 1979, the claimed climate sensitivity range was one and a half to four and a half uh, degrees, except uh, for the fourth assessment report where they changed it, but they returned it back on the, in the last report. This means that the predictions which were made in the first assessment report of the IPCC should have been valid. The temperature on Earth should have increased within this range of predictions. But what has uh, the temperature on Earth done? The temperature on Earth is now, uh, actually this is from two years ago, it continued to uh, below the range of predictions. So any decent theory uh, which made predictions, uh, when the predictions are not uh, uh, satisfied, they go back and say, okay, we have to update the uh, theory, we now understand better, we should change the predictions. But this is not what happens with the IPCC. What happens with the IPCC is that every six years they reset the predictions uh, clock, and uh, by definition we're always within the range of predictions. <laughs> Alarmists ignore the fact that the sun has an effect uh, on the climate, uh, because uh, it implies that uh, climate change is going to be much more benign than uh, what, we, uh, what we hear. So how do they manage to uh, ignore it? Well, the first thing I mentioned, uh, they just avoid uh, mentioning it. Uh, the fifth assessment report doesn't include uh, measurements or uh, quantifications of the solar forcing. There are other claims that uh, claim that the, uh, there is no solar climate uh, link. They simply claim that it's wrong, and I'll give you one example. And then they also claim that uh, without a mechanism, um, it cannot be considered seriously. Okay, so here is an example for someone claiming that there's no solar effect. Uh, recently, uh, say in the past uh, year or two, uh, came out the uh, uh, Berkeley uh, temperature uh, reconstruction of Earth, the uh, best temperature reconstruction. Uh, it's not that they are the best, uh, it's just the acronym is the best, that's all. And uh, they claimed uh, in one of the uh, follow-up papers that uh, they don't see any solar effect. 
So the sun is not affecting the climate, or it has a minor effect on the climate. And why is that? Um, it's very simple. What they try to do, they try to correlate uh, the predicted temperature, assuming that uh, it is some response of the CO2 and some uh, response of the uh, solar activity, and compare it to the observed uh, temperature. Now, what they didn't take into account um, when they did this uh, annual comparison is that climate is a low-pass filter, which means that a one watt per square meter response on a few year time scale is much smaller than a one watt per square meter response on a centennial time scale. And such a simple comparison necessarily kills the solar effect because you don't see a large temperature increase over the 11 year solar cycle because of the low pass filter effect of the, of the climate. Then they also said, let's uh, uh, not look at annual data, let us look at uh, decadally average data. Uh, but when you look at the decadally average data and you throw away the data that uh, basically the 11 year solar cycle, um, over the 20th century you have the anthropogenic forcings which increased and you have also the solar activity which increased almost monotonically. So uh, when you do that, uh, you actually cannot differentiate between the two effects and the lower limit that they put on the solar effect when they do this kind of a comparison actually includes the real number. So uh, they didn't prove that the sun doesn't have an effect on climate. Uh, we know now, with a lot of empirical evidence that we'll see in the next talk, that the sun affects the climate through modulation of the uh, cosmic rays. Okay, so uh, just as a teaser, uh, this is the effect. The sun, uh, which has a solar wind, uh, we know that from uh, comets, for example, we see cometary tails, uh, we can see aurorae. Uh, this solar wind modulates the flux of high energy particles which come from outside the solar system. They actually come from the death of massive uh, stars. These high energy particles are the dominant source of ions in the atmosphere, such that when the sun is more active, we get uh, less cosmic rays and less ionization. We therefore get eventually less growth of cloud condensation nuclei, which are particles needed in order to condense water vapor and form uh, cloud droplets. So you change the characteristics of the clouds, you make them less white when you get a, a stronger solar wind, less cosmic rays, less cloud condensation nuclei, uh, droplets uh, or clouds which are less white, so you reflect less of the sunlight and increase the temperature. So in fact, there is a mechanism, and we have a lot of empirical evidence to suggest that it uh, exists, um, which means that you must take the sun into account. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, there's a very large uh, solar climate effect, um, and we can quantify it. Uh, if you take it into account, you have to change your perception of what climate change has been over the 20th century, and what uh, climate sensitivity is. Uh, sorry, what ha it has been on the 20th century and what it will be in the 21st century. Um, and it will still be ignored by the climate community because uh, it's hard for them uh, to take it into account. And I think I will end uh, with this really succinct uh, summary, which tells us uh, the following. Uh, I'm quoting Al Gore, quoting uh, Mark Twain, who said that what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. 